Um, we will post the slide deck and some notes um, at the end. Please just remain on mute unless you're talking. Um, and at the during the discussion points, please feel free to use the chat or also raise your hand. Um, and without any further ado, I'll turn the meeting over to Commissioner Lambrew and she'll give us her opening remark. Thank you so much, Sarah and Paul and Lauren and Karen and the entire team for pulling this council together and allowing me to say a few words of welcome before, unfortunately, I have to sign off. It was four years ago during Older Americans Month that the Maine Department of Health and Human Services under Paul Saussier's leadership held a convening for opportunities to improve long-term services and supports for people in Maine. That meeting resulted in a planning process for improvements in quality and access and options for older Mainers. But that work, like everything else, was interrupted by COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it really did highlight that what had been important prior to the pandemic is now urgent. COVID-19 had a disproportionate impact on nursing home residents, accounting for nearly a quarter of deaths nationwide. Although Maine fared better than most states, we did share in this national tra tragedy in terms of scores of outbreaks, illness, and deaths. The physical layout of most nursing facilities, we had long open hallways, shared rooms, shared baths, allow infection to spread with ease in a single facility. In many cases, inadequate infection control practices exacerbated the intensity and the duration of outbreaks. Moreover, public perception of nursing and residential care facilities has been damaged by this highly visible challenge in the nurse in the long-term care sector, necessitating new thinking about how do we attract workers and attract residents to the kind of quality and safe places. Safe places. That they so there are these are all reasons why the department is launching the Innovation and Quality Council. Its purpose is to help us improve nursing and residential care facility services in Maine. We thank each of you for your participation and need your help to identify what really matters to residents, which quality metrics are most important to monitor and reward, and what innovations to pursue. The development of the department's reform bill, LD 1575, envisions several areas of potential focus, including, but not limited to, Enhanced person-centered care that recognizes residents' preferences. Safer homes with better infection control practices, reduce medication errors, and reduce falls. Small house models that are more homely, that have better staff retention and prevent the spread of disease. Universal support positions that empower staff to provide more holistic care. And incentives in the form of technical assistance, waivers of certain requirements, grants and alternative payment models that reward value. We have also begun to look, <clears throat> we have begun to look at Maine's uh, facilities quality and we'll share some of those early observations with you today. We are not alone in this work. The National Academies have thoroughly reviewed available evidence and offered us their recommendations. And we are so excited to have with us today, Betty Farrell, the chair of the Committee on the Quality of Care and Nursing Homes to share those recommendations. So I'll end where I began saying thank you. I appreciate your help in improving Maine's nursing and residential care facilities and the quality of care for those residents. And with that, I will turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to ask you to spend a few minutes uh, telling us uh, why you're interested in this work in just a minute. Before we do that, we, we have, um, several representatives from the department here today. Uh, we also have representatives from the Guidehouse team that is uh, a vendor uh, helping us with uh, some of the rate and other related work. Uh, and they're, they're here to observe and listen today. Uh, I, we won't introduce uh, everybody, but I would like to uh, have some of the department leadership uh, say uh, a quick hi. And so uh, we have with us Ben Mann, uh, Associate Commissioner for Finance. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Benjamin Mann, like Paul said, I'm Deputy Commissioner for Finance, uh, effectively the COO, CFO for the department. Uh, I'm excited about this engagement. I think it'll be uh, productive and it's um, 
uh, and it's uh, needed for payment reform efforts going forward. So thanks for, for everyone's participation uh, today and going forward. And Michelle? Good morning, everyone. Michelle Probert, Main Care Director. I'm likewise excited about this meeting. Uh, uh, we always spend a lot of time at the department talking about uh, reimbursement for long-term care, uh, and I'm excited that this group is going to focus more on the quality aspect. Um, so you'll hear from me more later and uh, look forward to this work with you. Thank you. And Bill. Morning, everyone. I'm Bill Monteo, the Director of Licensing and Certification, and also with me on this call is Heather Hyatt, who's our Associate Director within Licensing. And uh, we have uh, also from ODES, uh, Karen Mason, who is helping lead this work um, at ODES, uh, as well um, as Lauren Michalakis, who uh, our clinical advisor, um, who has been working on um, some, uh, a lot of this work as well. And so now I'm going to turn it back to Sarah to, to lead, uh, lead you all through the introductions. Yes, so we're just going to take a few minutes to all introduce ourselves very briefly. Um, if you could just tell us your name, your uh, organization that you're affiliated with, and what draws you um, to this work about innovation and quality um, within the council. So Jake Anderson, if you could take it off. Sure. Uh, my name is Jake Anderson. I'm the administrator at Maine Veterans Home here in Augusta. Uh, we are a one of the first small house models here in the state of Maine. Uh, have been operating uh, since March of last year and began our transition to the small house model with our staff and some of the uh, theories behind the model um, now over four years ago. Um, so happy to be here. Quality and uh, leading the way is certainly you know, part of our organization's mission. And uh, this is a great forum for that. So appreciate the invite. And I happen to be sitting with Jake, so I'll just go next if that's all right. Because uh, I am uh, Deirdre Hearsink. I'm the medical director for both the Maine Vets Home here in Augusta, as well as Gray Birch, which is a Maine general facility. And um, yeah, certainly lots of opportunities and very excited to get to kind of work together collaboratively to see what we can do to bring some improvements for all of our folks. Fabulous, thank you. Um, Lori Belden. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Lori Belden. I've used pronouns she, her, hers. Um, I'm the executive director of the Home Care and Hospice Alliance of Maine. Um, and as the home health and hospice um, uh, trade association, we think that we're one of the three pillars in the, the healthcare continuum of hospitals and nursing facilities. And um, I just think that access and quality are, are so important in, in the healthcare continuum and just really happy to be here to support the efforts. Great. Um, Ari Behrman? Not on. Um, Ms. Barbara Bowers? Yeah. Um Thank you. Uh, I'm a faculty emeritus in the School of Nursing at University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, and this is a really exciting opportunity. I mean, I've been doing research and teaching in long-term care since the early 1980s. And this is the first time I've seen any sort of an effort like this, both nationally and then Maine has just really picked up the baton. Um, so this is exciting. Thank you for uh, including me. Thank you. Uh, Maureen Carlin. I am Maureen Carlin. I am the Director of Quality and Regulatory Affairs for Maine Healthcare Association. Uh, prior to this role, I was an administrator at the Veterans Home in Scarborough, and we were uh, received the first ACA Gold Quality Award. So I've been extremely engaged for many years using the Baldrige criteria uh, through the ACA Quality Award programs. So quality is just um, I love it. I love Baldridge stuff and anything we can do to improve our uh, for our seniors is great. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Brenda Gallant. Good morning. So um, as you all know, the main long-term care ombudsman program is the advocacy program for residents across the continuum of long-term services and supports. I'm really excited about this. I think Maine has so many advantages over other states. I talk with other ombudsmen. I think there's more of a collaborative effort, a real focus in Maine on quality and collaboration. Um, and we do hear from residents, staff, and families about some of the quality issues that have resulted most, you know, especially in response to uh, the pandemic. So we really look forward to this 
opportunity to work together and to improve quality of care. That's great. Um, let's go to Leo Delicata. Good morning. Uh, I'm Leo Delicata. I'm a lawyer with Legal Services for the Elderly, and I've been involved in uh, policy discussions about nursing facilities and long-term care since the early 90s. And I'm really looking forward to this particular effort, and um, I hope to be of help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary Lou Siofi. Good morning, everybody. Mary Lou Cialfi. I am uh, currently the senior program manager at the University of Maine Center on Aging and doing research on person-centered care in long-term care. Uh, I'm an attorney, uh, also a former residential care administrator, and um, very gratefully serving on the Goal 1 Committee for the National Moving Forward Coalition. And thank you for inviting me. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Uh, Betsy Grass. Well, thought I saw her on here. Uh, maybe we'll go to Karen Lee Harrington. Good morning, everybody. My name is Karen Lee Harrington, and I'm the executive director of the Maine Health Data Organization and the Maine Quality Forum, both the state agencies. Uh, they're independent, um, which means I serve at the pleasure of a board of directors. Um, the bottom line is I think the reason why um, I'm here and, and interested in this work is the Maine Health Data Organization is the repository for healthcare data. So we collect all kinds of data, um, different kinds of data, but we collect quality data through a rule chapter 270. Um, and it has primarily focused on quality data from hospitals. And a couple of years ago, my board made the decision, um, and, and this is a major substantive rule, so it also has to go through the legislative process, and they endorsed this to require nursing facilities to report their lab ID events for C. diff. So we are starting to um, look at that sector. Um, and I think, you know, working with all of you, um, you know, and, 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 and others and, and figuring out going forward, are there other data um, uh, measures that people would like to collect. We collect it, we report on it. Uh, working with the Maine Quality Forum, we're responsible for producing an annual report to the legislature on the status of healthcare associated infections. And that too is focused on uh, hospitals and you know, going forward uh, as needs change, um, you know, we may want to broaden that. So really excited about being here and, and, and hopefully um, some of the work that we do in these agencies can support the efforts that you're all trying to do through data. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try Betsy Grass once more. I think I saw her on here. I want to give her the opportunity to introduce herself before I move on. If you haven't caught on, I'm moving through you guys alphabetically. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Betsy Grass, the Director of Programs and Services at Alpha One, which is Maine's um, only independent living center. Even though much of our focus is on independent living and community-based services, we also work with and interact with consumers who choose nursing facility care. So I'm very interested in the quality aspect of those services. Thank you. Um, Leanne Howard. Hi there, um, Leanne Howard, Vice President of Clinical Excellence at Northern Light Home Health and Hospice. And we have a number of um, patients that we care for that are in facilities as well as quite a few joint partnerships with facilities throughout the state and um, obviously providing care for people in their homes or as they transition to, um, to a facility. Great, uh, Jenna Jones. Good morning, everyone. Jenna Jones, Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Maine Council on Aging. In addition to advocating on our collective ability to age in a manner that allows us to remain healthy and engaged and secure wherever we call home, one of the core pillars of our work right now is in access to care, um, specifically focusing on the direct care workforce. To that end, we're leading a broad coalition called the main Essential Care and Support Workforce Partnership, releasing our first report today on the uh, cost of undervaluing direct care work. So excited to be here. 
Thank you. Uh, let's go to Ruta Kadnoff. Morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Ruta Kadnoff. I'm Vice President for Programs with Maine Health Access Foundation. Um, we have a pretty broad lens on um, health care and access to quality health care issues. Um, prior to coming to Maine, though, I spent about 25 years of my career focused on advancing person-centered care and quality of care in the nursing home setting between um, advocating for change and supporting providers to actually implement that change, including uh, a number of years working with the Greenhouse Project and working one-on-one -on -one with organizations transitioning to that model. So I'm a passionate advocate for quality of care and person-centered care in particular. Um, I think it's possible. I think it's what we all deserve and should be um, seeking to create not only for um, the people who need it today, but for ourselves as we age. Um, Right now, our work is primarily focused on workforce related issues and the challenges that those create for access to care. I'm also deeply concerned about the loss of um, nursing home beds and the impact of that on access um, to care, especially as someone who lives in Belfast. So just heard this week that we are losing one of our facilities here. Um, so thanks very much for including me in this. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Richard Marino. Hi, I'm Rich Marino. I'm the nursing home director for Maine Medical Partners Geriatrics. Uh, we provide care in, I think, 27 nursing home and residential care facilities um, around the state, uh, mostly in Cumberland County, but also in Oxford, York, and Franklin counties. Great. Laura Tremblay. No, no, moving on. Um, let's have now Tompkins. No, uh, Judy Tupper. Good morning. I'm Judy Tupper, and I'm Director of Population Health and Health Policy at the Cutler Institute, University of Southern Maine. And I'm a faculty member for the graduate program in public health, and I also teach in the nursing school. And the courses I teach are interprofessional for graduate students in patient safety, quality improvement, and health literacy. Um, so I have um, quite an interest in what's going on here and have done um, quite a bit of research work in, in the long-term care setting, including workforce safety. Thanks for inviting me. That's great. Uh, Megan Walton. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Megan Walton with Southern Maine Agency on Aging. Um, and I am excited about this conversation because as the local area agency on aging, we work with a lot of families who are trying to navigate different options for relatives. And I would love to be able to share more about the quality initiatives that this group is working on. So I'm excited to be here. Great. Uh, Heidi Weirman. Yeah, I'm Heidi Weierman, rhymes with fireman, uh, the division director for geriatrics at Maine Medical Center um, and the medical director for healthy aging at Maine Health. And I just love working in the long-term care community with this group. I think it's so collaborative and I think we do such great work here in Maine. And this is an opportunity to continue to move quality while also focusing on what matters to people as well, which sometimes comes in conflict with what we measure for quality. So I like to kind of think about balancing that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's move to Wanda Wilcock. No. All right. I think that rounds up our list then. Sarah? Um, yes. I, I neglected to point out that um, CDC is joining us in this collaborative effort at the department. Rita, could you just say a word? Hi, I'm Rita Oshak. I'm the program director for the Healthcare Epidemiology Program. We work with hospitals and nursing homes to prevent and reduce healthcare associated infections and antibiotic resistance. Great, thank you. And now I think we can turn it over uh, to Lauren and she can introduce our next speaker. 
Hey, gosh, it's so exciting to see everybody here today. This is this is really, really amazing. So I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Betty Farrell as our guest presenter and speaker today. Dr. Farrell is presently the Director of Nursing Research and Education and a professor at the City of Hope in Duarte, California. Thank you for being up so early today, Betty. Um, she's been a nurse for many years with the focus of her clinical expertise and research in pain management, quality of life and palliative care. She has an extensive resume, which I think we included a link in the agenda. Um, well, please, please take a look at it. I can't possibly do it justice in this time allotted. allotted. But the, her contributions to the field of palliative care include over 480 publications and texts. She co-authored three prominent textbooks, including the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Care Nursing, The Nature of Suffering and the Goals of Nursing, and Making Healthcare Whole, Integrating Spirituality into, into Patient Care. You can see that she's got a wide, wide uh, range and, and, and uh, reach to her interests. In 2013, Dr. Farrell was one of the 30 visionaries in the field. Uh, identified by the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine in 2019. She was elected a member of the National Academy of Medicine. In 2021, Dr. Farrell received the Oncology Nursing Society Lifetime Achievement Award, and she was inducted as a living legend by the American Nursing, by the American Academy of Nursing, excuse me. And with regard to today's presentation, she was chair of the Committee on the Quality of Care in Nursing Homes by the American Academies of Science, Engineering, and, and Medicine. The result of that committee's work was the release in April of 2022, the National Academies Report, um, Consensus Study Report, the uh, National Imperative to Improve Nursing Home Quality, which is a tremendous 600-page document, which is just filled with uh, rich information, the topic of which we're going to be discussing today. The last thing I just would like to say about Dr. Farrell is that there's many of us in Maine who know her uh, simply as Betty. She's been a, a longtime friend, advocate, educator, and mentor to many palliative care clinicians in the state of Maine, including myself. So thank you for being here, Betty. We appreciate your willingness to help kick, kick off our efforts here. And again, greatly appreciate the fact that you got up so early for us today. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's always a joy to be with you. And uh, I consider many, many friends in Maine. And as you can you know, well imagine, when people like me spend you know, a year or two years of our time to create a report and to try to do our best to lay out a roadmap and direction, you know, what we want most is to know that it really will be used. And so um, on behalf of all of my committee members, but also the leadership of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine, we really thank you for your leadership, because we know that's what it takes is leadership. You know, we can write long reports, but we need a state to step forward and say, you know, we are going to show the country how to, how to lead the way. And so we've been so impressed with the work that you're doing, which of course is no surprise to me because I've seen the leadership that comes from Maine for many, many years across you know, many areas of my work. So thank you all for all that you're doing. The leaders of the National Academy are also aware of our meeting today and uh, are really like myself and my committee members, so, so interested in seeing your implementation efforts ahead. So what I'm going to do is just to do a really brief um, review. I'm really just going to touch uh, on the key uh, outcomes of our work and then also our key recommendations. And then I'll pause and see if there are any questions that I can answer or engage in any conversation. Um, and sh shall I advance the slides, Lauren, or am I set up to do that? Or shall I just say next? I mean... Oops, I don't think I can advance. So we can go to the next slide. No? Great. So at the National Academies, I just wanted to acknowledge that the um, committee work was supported by several foundations and the lead was the John Hartford Foundation, but you'll see the names of other groups that supported our work in creating this report. Thank you. Next. Also, I really want to always emphasize, you know, I'm here is just uh, to represent the work that was accomplished by the committee. The committee is now completed, but as you can see, I and everyone on the committee are still really dedicated to this work and available in any way that we can help you. Um, I had the real pleasure of chairing this committee, but there are many people that were on the committee. I know some of these are people that you are, you're, have worked with or very familiar with. 
And so each of these people also brought their own career experiences and they brought different experiences from quality to finance to um, patient-centered care. And so we are a whole committee still dedicated to help with the implementation of this work. Next. So <clears throat> as you probably know, whenever the National Academies are asked by Congress or other groups to create a report, um, it begins with a statement of task. And our task was a broad task, it was to examine how our nation delivers, regulates, finances, and measures the quality of nursing home care. We were also asked to delineate a framework and general principles for improving the quality of care in nursing homes. And we were asked to consider how the COVID-19 pandemic was impacting that care. One of the things that we really want to always emphasize, and I'm sure this will be a part of your conversation, is that while we were writing our report in the midst of the pandemic, you know, we of course thought it was so important to consider the pandemic and reflect on how it was impacting uh, these problems. But by absolutely, our report is not focused just on challenges in nursing homes during the pandemic. And what we always like to say is, and the really important thing now that we are in 2023 and moving forward, is that every problem we talk about in our report existed before the pandemic. And primarily, you know, what we can say it was the pandemic. It was the fact that we all woke up every day to our social media or newspapers to see right there in front of us pictures, you know, the vision of what was happening in nursing homes. Every day we saw the numbers of people dying in nursing homes. And so the COVID pandemic made more visible the problems that so many people want to not think about. You know, most of us don't want to think about nursing homes. And unless we have someone we love that's in the nursing home, the public really doesn't know the concerns in the nursing home. One of the members who spoke to our committee said COVID has lifted the veil on nursing home care. And I think that is really true. Next. So I'm going to start with the conclusions and just say that after about a year and a half of work by the total committee, um, these were our overarching conclusions. And the first of the conclusions is that the way in which the United States finances, delivers, and regulates care in nursing home settings is ineffective, inefficient, fragmented, and unsustainable. And so, as you can see, you know, by intention, our committee wanted to be really clear in our first overall conclusion. This is not a minor problem. This is not an area with a few, you know, minor things that need to be fixed. This is a huge problem and this system simply can't continue. Um, the second overarching conclusion is that immediate action to initiate fundamental change is necessary. We really do need to act now because there are citizens, there are so many people that whose lives and quality of life really depend on the care that happens today. Our third conclusion is that stakeholders need to make a clear and shared commitment to improve the quality of nursing home residents. So it's wonderful to see so many of you. Um, I, I just can't, I can't not say this. I, um, I was so pleased when you were beginning to uh, introduce yourselves to hear so many of you representing veterans because I have a strong uh, place in my heart for veterans and in the work that I do in LNEC and other projects, we try to really make sure people understand that the care of veterans. And so thank you for all of you who are committed to the care of veterans. And we do know that many veterans are now living in nursing homes and we owe a great deal of debt to improve their care. Um, the fourth conclusion is to ensure that quality improvement initiatives are implemented using strategies that do not exacerbate disparities in resource allocation, quality of care, or resident outcomes. So we, you know, our report gives great detail about nursing home quality is the big challenge for most residents, but for anyone of underrepresented uh, groups, there are even greater disparities. Next. Um, our fifth conclusion is that high quality research is needed to advance the quality of care. We need data. 
you know, we need to have data that guides improved care. The sixth conclusion is that the nursing home sector has suffered for decades from underinvestment, ensuring the quality of care and the lack of accountability for how resources are allocated, which is why your work is so important because you can do both of those things, really direct investment in quality issues and accountability. And our seventh conclusion is that all relevant federal agencies need to be granted the authority and resources from Congress to implement the recommendations of our report. Next. So these were the overarching conclusions. And again, we started with creating a vision and our vision, what do we want? What would better care look like? Um, was that the vision is that the residents of nursing homes receive care in a safe environment that honors their values and preferences, addresses their goals of care, promotes equity, and assesses the benefits and risks of care and treatment. One of the mantras that came up in our committee over and over again is that the nursing home is a home, right? It is where people live. And, you know, every time I look at this vision, residents of nursing homes receive care in a safe environment that honors their values and preferences and goals of care, promotes equity and assesses risk and benefits. My first gut response every time I read that statement is, that's not too much to ask, right? Wouldn't every one of us on this call hope that we live in a place that's safe, that where our goals can be respected. And so this is our vision and it may sound lofty in some ways, but this is pretty basic of what people should expect. Next. So now I'll just touch quickly on each of the goals. Our first goal is that we believe that we need to deliver comprehensive person-centered equitable care that ensures residents health, quality of life and safety and promotes autonomy and manages risks. So you'll see by intention in our report, you know, we, like you, you know, we had to dive into big issues of financing and regulation and coordinating the state agencies. But we wanna make sure that our report started with the person, the, the real person living in a nursing home. And the fact that that person needs to have comprehensive person-centered care and so, you know, this really does get down to basic things like when you become a resident of a nursing home, has somebody taken the time to find out, you know, what do you like for breakfast? Right? What, what would give you joy in the afternoon? Is it listening to the radio? Is it sitting outside for a few minutes? Like, who are you as a human being, as a person? And what can we do that would improve the quality of your life? Next. Our second goal is to ensure a well-prepared, empowered, and appropriately compensated workforce. And we all know this is about the workforce. We will never improve the quality of lives of residents of nursing homes until we have a well-prepared, empowered, and compensated workforce. Next. Goal three is to increase the transparency and accountability of finances, operations, and ownership. And again, you know, across the nation, I mean, in the, even in our own understanding of this problem, you know, the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability of people who take a great deal of public money um, and then are not transparent or accountable about how those funds are really used to benefit the people that live in the nursing home. Next. Fourth goal is to create a more rational and robust financing system. And so, of course, we know that all of those elements of quality and the care delivered depends on the financing system. Next, our goal is to design a more effective and responsive system of quality assurance. And again, I really want to just echo, you know, all of our enthusiasm for the work that you're doing because we need a Maine, you know, we need a state like you to step forward in a unified way, really demonstrate what good quality looks like and how an effective and responsive system of quality assurance would, would before the crisis begins, right? One of the things that I like to say throughout our entire committee's report is if we had the next COVID, you know, later this year, if the next surge of COVID or the next, you know, public health crisis, it would be exactly the same nightmare as we all watched unfold the last few years. If we don't change the way that nursing home care happens, 
we are destined to go through the same thing. 25% of deaths in the country happened in nursing homes. That is very disproportionate to the, where people are living. And so your development of quality, uh, quality metrics, quality monitoring will be a model for the country. Next. Our sixth goal is to expand and enhance quality measurement and continuous quality improvement. And again, it, you know, these goals really go hand in hand, but what should we measure? What's most important to residents? Measuring the right things. And then how do we really make sure that that data and these systems of measurement yield continuous quality improvement? Next. And our seventh goal is to adopt health information technology in all nursing homes. We've all seen how technology has expanded so tremendously across health settings and how technology has made it possible to really improve care, particularly in acute care settings, through telehealth, through access to patient medical information from rural communities. There's so many ways that technology can change care. And so once again, we have not seen that same degree of technology use in nursing homes. And we think that there should be great adoption of some of the advances in technology to be used in these settings. Next. So that is just a quick summary of sort of our overarching conclusion, our goals and our recommendations. Um, as you've heard, the entire report can be found on um, free access through the National Academies. And uh, there are other documents there to, to continue to support your efforts. And the staff, of course, at the National Academies are also available support, as are all the members of the committee. So we thank you for your commitment, and I'm glad to answer any questions or um, any thoughts that you would like to share about the work from the committee. Question, Betty, I can get it started. I mean, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time, you know, reviewing some of the content of the of the report and i think you know it's overwhelming it's daunting you know there's there's only seven recommendations but there's seven recommendations and each one is is so so important i've heard you say before that we can't think about doing these seven recommendations in a piecemeal in a, in a piecemeal fashion in other words the the the, the sum is really is a, is is you know a function of the total of every single um recommendation that you make yet, yet it's it's we're gonna get in our own way we're gonna we're gonna have a hard time if we think we have to do it all at once and there is a part in the um in the document that talks about you know short-term you know immediate needs and short-term needs can you can you comment on what you how how how, how do we do this sure so when we, um, and each of these, you know, I just gave you kind of the summary statements, but when you go into the report, you'll see that in each, you know, area of goals and recommendations, we do have kind of sub statements where we break each of those goals down in some detail. You know, one of the things that when we were writing our report again, you know, released um, almost a year, well, a year ago, because last April was still at, you know, peak time of the pandemic. And so, you know, our concern is that people would say, oh, we're just so overwhelmed, we can't do anything. And so, um, or these goals are really large. And so, you know, we, we need to study them five more years, right? Or, and, you know, we, we can't, can't act. And so in the back of the report, you know, we were asked to try to prioritize in a way and it, or really prioritize in terms of implementation because we believe all the goals are, are critically important, but, we did create a graph where we went through and identified, you know, where to begin and like what things can be done now, because, um, you know, we we really do think that obviously creating a whole new financing system, or you know, creating a you know statewide quality monitoring, quality implementation, et cetera, you know, that's not going to happen next month. But what are the things that should begin? And so. And we know where do we begin now with the resources that we have? And so I do think that's really important. You know, it's important for people to say, where do we start and what can we do now? And I think a couple of examples. You know, one is I think it's just so important, as with most problems, you know, and most public health problems, 
it's very important to be, you know, very, very open with the public and to be vocal, you know, with the public. And so, uh, you know, as a state, I would really, you know, really encourage you to, you know, for widespread discussion in the community to share the work that you're doing as you do it, to, you know, really let your state know the, about your commission and of what you're doing and get their input. And because I think constant public awareness, again, as, you know, as nursing home COVID deaths are not on the front page of the newspaper as often now, you know, our public attention team seems to kind of fade away. So I would be really vocal, um, continue to make the problems known, you know, continue to engage the public in understanding this is, I mean, this is basic humanity, right? This is, this is caring for people that need care the most. And so I, I think that's something that's important. Um, as we prioritized, I think uh, train, you know, the workforce, you know, I, to me keeps coming forward as an area of high priority because we really won't be able to do those other goals unless we've done something about the workforce. And, you know, again, like, training of the workforce it is astounding you know to look at the turnover rates in nursing homes it's astounding to look at how little preparation that they have i mean start there right i mean shouldn't there be a basic this is your mother or father or grandmother you know in that nursing home wouldn't you hope that the person who's going to be taking care of them tomorrow knows how to transfer them safely from their bed you know, wouldn't you hope that somebody has been trained in basic infection control precautions? So I think, you know, starting with steps like for anyone, you know, who's going to work in, in a nursing home setting, here's the basic knowledge, the basic amount of time for training. There, there are basic steps that I think we have to put into place that simply aren't there. And we should be, you know, we should be thinking, you know, about innovations. Like for example, not every nursing home in the state needs to create their own training program. You know, can't, can't you, you know, like create a training program and then make it accessible, you know, online, make it, you know, free access so that, you know, again, we remove a barrier is nobody has to travel somewhere to do the training and everybody can get the training free. Like, you know, we need to put some things in place that can be shared, can be accessible, um, are, you know, that you really could have that, you know, happen in a few months, and then know that there are other things that will take a little bit longer. I mean, we should, we can begin to, you know, mandate that on admission, and for all current residents, but on admission for all future residents, that there is a a system in place that somebody is assessed, who is this person, what's important to them, um, you know, what are their values? Like these are basic, basic care issues of quality. And so I think, you know, go for the low hanging fruit, um, go for things that aren't terribly complicated or expensive, because I think once we begin to see changes in nursing homes, that leads to more interest in more change. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I say something? Let me turn in here. I see I might be out of order, but hey, um, I just appreciate everything in the context of this report. I think it's helpful to chunk it. And um, I had been involved in a pilot funded by MEHAF over the last year that just concluded. And it was one that was trying to um, recognize with our staff turnover that our ability for our staff to know our residents really decreased. So we engaged with a the life story pilot where we had volunteers through our hospital that were the help volunteers come for residents that were interested and do an hour long life story that was recorded securely on Zoom. And then a professional writer through a organization called Memory Well wrote the story that then the patient and family could modify. And then a laminated version of that was hung in the, the residents room so that our new staff as they're coming on can learn a little more about our folks Part of the intention is again to help the the residents themselves kind of express their priorities and a little sense of their, what's important to them. And another is really um, seeing if we get more investment with our staff and who our residents are, if it would help our retention. So 
we'll see where it gets to, but it's been extremely positive. So if anybody's interested, I'm happy to send them the pilot results. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, and that's it's so important to realize that yes, some of the things we want to do will require, you know, major government involvement and structural changes and financing. A lot of the things that we want to do to improve nursing and quality are really, as you said, like how how do we know the story of this person, right? And then once they've told us their story, you know, how does that become integrated in their care, right? If I if you if I now know that you served in World War II, you know, then that's important for me to know. But it, then what does that mean? It means, is there, are there people that, you know, are available volunteers to just come and talk with you about your service? Or do we honor you, you know, on Veterans Day? Or um, do you want a flag in your room? I mean, uh, the same, you know, I, I always share like one of the great examples, my mother-in-law was cared for in an outstanding nursing home. And I remember walking to the nursing home for the first time and every patient room had a kind of a, a glass display case outside the room where every new resident you know, was invited to bring sort of things of importance from their life, whether photographs or objects or whatever. And it, it not only did, I mean, it was just such a way of valuing that every, every room, every person, every room is a different person, but then it was the way to engage in conversation. Every housekeeper, you know, visitor, everybody who walked in the room was like, oh, I saw, you know, this, that, you know, this, you know, church bulletin, you know, my, I went to that church or, you know, my grandmother went to that church. So there are things that we can do that humanize care and honor people's lives um, that don't have to be so terribly complicated. I think I saw another hand. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Betty, for your presentation. And I have a, a comment for our group and then a question for you. Um, and, and the comment is, I couldn't help but notice how many times I saw the word transparency in your presentation. And I think transparency breeds trust. And I think that's really what we're after in, in our community is how do we kind of pull back the curtain on a system that's really shrouded in secrecy and and bring more transparency and accountability. So I hope that we continue to come back to that as a group. Um, and then the second is just building on, on your um, comments earlier. I'm curious what advice or recommendations you would give to us as providers and as council members, because the national pulse has changed so much in the last few years. And with the strong preference of so many older Americans to age at home in their community. Um, how do we, again, kind of rebrand this effort and make sure that we're honoring those preferences, but also being realistic in our conversations with folks? Just curious what recommendations you have. And so just to make sure, uh, it was cutting out just a bit, but specifically you're talking about advanced directives and promoting aspect of quality care. Is, is that right? Yeah, I think I think just because the pandemic for so many older individuals made them that much more right. fearful right. or concerned about right. residential and nursing home facilities. And so if those preferences towards staying at home or remaining at home and remaining in community are only increasing how do we grapple with that through right. this committee's work yeah yes sure i think you know when we say honoring values and you know patient-centered care then absolutely that means you know one of the most important things is um you know the absolute vast majority of people who come into the nursing home will die in the nursing home or you know will die after that admission to the nursing home and so Again, you know, I think sometimes the public doesn't understand or even patients and families don't understand that um, that this really becomes your home. And so, you know, when someone becomes sick, like, do they really want to be spend the last hours of their lives, you know, in a bumpy ambulance and put in a new environment and then be cared for by strangers? Or, you know, when you get that call as a daughter saying, you know, your your mother's had a stroke. Um, then you want that daughter to already be thinking, oh, wait a minute, you know, this is what we talked about, like that wonderful aide, you know, John has been, you know, bathing my mother and he takes such good care of her and he knows just how to turn her to, you know, keep her comfortable. And like, 
it would be better if she could stay there, right? And be, she, we want, you know, maybe it's going to take, you know, me as the daughter, you know, a day or two to get there. But, you know, we, you know, I want my mother to be cared for. I want her last hours to be faces that she's familiar with, somebody who knows, you know, how to help her sip her juice or turn her or bathe her, whatever. And so I think we have to make this an issue of quality that this isn't just one more form to sign. This is, this is, part of our effort to ensure the quality of your care is we want to hear from you what will be most important to you, you know, at this time of life. And so I think helping residents and families understand that to complete an advanced directive, to let us know their values and preferences is one big step in us honoring them as people. And that, you know, to do this, it's like, we can tell you things that we're gonna to do to avoid a bad infection. Well, let me tell you some things that we're gonna to do to avoid a potentially very bad outcome, you know, when you get to the end of life. And so having an advanced directive, having us know your values and preferences could help us really put care into place that would avoid, you know, your last 24 hours being spent, you know, in an ambulance ride, uh, several hours in an ED, you know, in a frightening place being cared for by strangers. And then, you know, again, death in a strange place by, you know, strangers. So I think we have to frame this as this is one of the greatest things that you can do, right, for the person you love is to make sure that we have a plan. Can, can I just add to that a little bit to get at, I think part of Megan's, part of your question, Megan, is, you know, are we doing this to the detriment of home care, for example? I mean, I'll just be really blunt about it. We need to work on all parts in Maine. <laughs> um, and so I think for what, 20 years, the debate in LTSS has been about rebalancing and moving away from nursing homes and doing more in the community. And that remains a goal because of those preferences that you indicated, but we, we can't neglect the quality of nursing home and residential care because we're also focused on building the the community system in Maine all of the system was battered during COVID and you know so in other projects we're looking at the whole continuum and I think that's important to do uh, and and message that we're we're uh, we're interested in improving the quality of the entire continuum. You see a couple raised hands. I think Karen Lee. I think you were first. Thank you, uh, Betty, thank you so much for being here and sharing um, all this work that uh, you and your colleagues have been doing. Um, I, I have a quick question just regarding the um, comments you made around data. And, you know, we don't know what we can't measure. And that's what I've been, right, uh, working on for most of my career with the state is data. And so a question that I have is, you know, is there a framework or recommendation around, you know, what are some of the data elements that you should start with? Um, because I know for us here in Maine, starting with C. diff and a lab ID event and, and Rita um, Oshwick, who, who is on the call from the CDC, we worked very closely on this together with a group of, um, nursing home administrators. I mean, we did this collective, you know, we, we worked on agreeing that this was a measure to start with. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most of the nursing homes in Maine, I think all of them now, in fact, are reporting into NHSN. Um, so there's, it feels like there's an opportunity going forward to collect more data. But, you know, I, I, what we hear is there's so much turnover Mm -hmm. Um, and there isn't, you know, an individual who is like in the hospital, the infection preventionist in the nursing home, you know, it's, it's, it's probably, uh, the nurse or the head of, right. And they've got a lot of other competing priorities. So I just curious because it feels like there's so many different things that have to come together, but at the end of the day, if you don't have the data, how do you know where to focus? Right. Um, and so I'd just be curious in, in any comments you have, experience that you can share um, in that space. 
Sure. I mean, these issues that you raise are so important and we, trust me, we spent months and months, you know, talking about them. But a, a couple of things that I would say is that when you go to our report in the very first chapter, there's a kind of a conceptual model that we put forward of, to try to create a picture of what, are, what does quality look like, right? What are the elements of quality? And then we did, uh, there's a lot more detail, you know, in the, the detailed report about you know, what are the outcomes that we're measuring? You know, what variables, you know, when do we measure them? One of the, you know, kind of sub recommendations is we spend a lot of time talking about the role of the social worker and how, um, you know, there should be social worker involvement in nursing homes and the important role that they could play in doing an initial assessment so that um, we can, you know, find out some of those personal preferences and make sure that, you know, kind of the what matters most sort of notion, what matters most to the resident is the thing that we should be measuring. And so um, I would, you know, just suggest that you read those sections uh, in a bit more detail. Um, one of the members of our committee, uh, Colleen Columbus, is a leader in this area, and she provided a lot of, lot of feedback. And so there's recommendations about social work involvement, because as you said, you know, the nurses are so overwhelmed with the physical care and medications. And so I think unless there's a designated person to really, you know, gather the, the resident data and then to put into play, you know, a plan, how will we um, respect, you know, these choices and preferences and then to make sure that what residents are telling us is so important to them is all of the things that we are measuring to, to say this is quality care. Obviously, we all want to avoid falls, we want to avoid infections, we want to know that people are kept well hydrated, but um, you know, safe. But what what extends beyond that to really constitute these again, this is people's lives. It's their, it's their home. You know, you and I would hope that, you know beyond basic safety that what constitutes quality of life for each of us, that we are also thinking about quality of life in that okay. broader sense. You, you know what, we have time for just one more question. So Heidi, you have to. You have to. Okay, thank you. Oh, I have so many thoughts, but I, know. Um, I just, um, you know, you had mentioned health information technology. So maybe I'll just stick there because we haven't really touched on that. And it seems like I do wonder, like as a state, if we have the opportunity to do something together, because there's so many challenges with communication and different EHRs and that sort of thing, um, not just within the nursing home, but communicating to outside agencies and things like that and bringing that together. But aside from health information technology, there's a lot of technology out there. And I do wonder with our aging infrastructure of our nursing homes, really challenging to bring technology in there. But as we build new facilities, what are the opportunities where technology can take over from some of the tasks we're using humans in now that can allow humans to do the things we need humans to do that are valuable to residents and taking away, you know, I look at like my son on campus and like you can order food and it comes in a little robot -y thing. And, you know, so, I mean, there's like, all these different ways to think about doing things that require investment that I don't think we've really tried to apply to this environment where there's so much physical care and maybe ways to do it safer and easier and potentially more independent for the residents um, as well. So I'll yes. just. Yeah. And I'll just uh, I'll comment. Greg Alexander is a nurse and has spent his career early on health technology and really passionate about health technology and nursing homes. He's at NYU and he is um, it, very involved uh, nationally and internationally in supporting efforts around you know, this very topic. So definitely would encourage you to, to be in contact with him because he, he's at Columbia in New York. Um, he loves to talk to anyone and I promise you would be a great resource for you because he's really, you know, working with a lot of people, um, both nationally and internationally on really the unique aspects of technology in nursing homes. And I know he would be glad to be of help. Jake, I saw you put your question in the, in the chat. Do you wanna ask it quick, quickly? Sure, my comment regarding data was just uh, long-term care has so many metrics that are, are currently measured. 
I can't imagine there isn't pre-existing uh, metrics out there that would meet our need for um, for the data to help make us decisions. Uh, one thing that is not robust is the resident-centered approach. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of resident-centered approaches with the small house or greenhouse models, um, that is a less robust mechanism and typically is organization by organization. Uh, but with a frayed uh, workforce and frayed um, organizations, finding more data that we need from them may be a step in the wrong direction for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. I, I wonder if we should move on. But before we do, I, I just want to make note of all the energy and all the all the need for conversation and questions that we have in the room and thinking that maybe, you know, people feel free to forward the questions to me and to Sarah and maybe we can find a way to get get some some answers from from you, Betty, and maybe other members of the of the committee, if that would be OK. Of course, yes. And I, yep. I just want to comment. I see a comment. Um, just in the chat before I sign off about leadership that yes, it's, you know, training of the workforce, but quality of leadership, right? Leaders will, we need oh. good leadership in these facilities to, to, to direct change. I mean, we, I think we all want the same thing, right? We all understand there's no, there's no doubt about the problem here. And so we do need to really foster leadership. So thank you. Well, I'll yep. sign up, but I uh, always appreciate being included in the conversation and I'm available anytime as are the staff at the academies and all of our committee members that I know would love to be available to you. Thank you. Well, we, we know where you live, so thank you. Good. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Betty. Thank That's you, really Betty. really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Yeah. In addition to questions, I would say to folks, you know, this is clearly generating ideas like what data sources we should be looking at, uh, you know, that we should be exploring technology applications, any of those ideas at any point, throw, drop them in the chat because we are, we will, um, we will preserve the chat um, and it will help us as we think about um, agendas for future meetings. Um, so with that, we want to pivot now to Maine, and uh, Michelle uh, has got some uh, preliminary uh, data to share with us. Great, thanks, Paula. Once again, my name is Michelle Probert. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director for Maine Care. Um, as a little bit of additional context, uh, I'm not a clinician. I am not a quality expert. Uh, I have spent a fair number of years now uh, really working on and interested in and thinking about how we can incent higher quality care uh, across healthcare as a whole um, through payment mechanisms and reimbursement in particular. Uh, but I think the real reason why Paul asked me to present these slides is just because I really like charts um, and <laughs> I, I, I love data. I like looking at data and I'm a visual person and I like thinking about the stories that the data may or may not tell. Um, and so I say that in part because um, uh, Betty mentioned uh, one of the recommendations for high quality research and with no disrespect at all to the folks who have put this data together, th these are baby steps. So we, we are at the beginning and it's really exciting to be able to be devoting resources and time to analysis of quality, but we're just starting out and we have limited resources and time and we have plans for what we're going to do next and do more of. Um, but I, I, I wanted to say that again, not out of disrespect or because I'm not excited about this analysis, but because um, it's hard. It's hard to look at data and to be able to say, oh, this is what the data means. Uh, sometimes it might appear to tell a story and that's not the real story because of factors that you can't see. Uh, uh, you'll see that, you know, we may be talking about hospitalizations, but the data we have looks at it in kind of different ways. And so it's hard to compare. Um, so I say that as a caveat, because as we go through slides, it's like, you know, I know that I want to be like, oh, this is the story, but we, we usually can't really do that. And we have ideas for follow-up analysis so that we are clear on the story. But I think the most important part of this data presentation is to generate questions uh, that we should all look into as we're thinking about our models of care delivery and our residents um, and, and what are the questions we want to ask more of so that uh, there is a clear story that we understand and, and can act on. All right, uh, I will share my screen.
as usual. I have too many things open, so I'm going to try to open up the right one. <laughs> Okay, do you folks see um, the proper full yes. view of the slide? Excellent. Okay, good. All right, so uh, before I start looking at the slides, um, so with these slides, we have data for nursing facilities. I will say that that is a bit more robust and vetted because we're really relying on data from CMS and their star ratings. It is not main care specific. Um, on the other hand, uh, with we're also looking at data for private non-medical institution PNMICs. Uh, in this presentation, I'll call them residential care facilities or RCFs. Um, and we're looking at our MDS data set primarily uh, uh, for those measures. Um, so uh, these slides on the nursing facility side tell a story of how does Maine look in comparison to national quality measures uh, and also what is the variation that we see um, between facilities that are kind of on, on the low end and the high end of CMS's star rating. On the residential care facility side, uh, we don't have national comparisons. Um, we can try in some cases, and I think it generates interesting conversation to say, how do these results compare to what we're seeing for nursing facilities? But oftentimes it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison. So we have to be really careful about that. But I think the most meaningful piece of the uh, residential care facility data that we have right now is to think about what are we seeing for variation within facilities or, or across uh, residential care facilities? Because that variation um, is, is really important. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the general theme of these slides. And we'll look a little bit at demographics and then we'll look at um, performance on certain quality measures that we thought were interesting. Uh, and then um, I have a couple of slides that just really start to look at, is there a relationship between how much we are paying for services and the quality of care that we are seeing? And um, again, I wanna give uh, a shout out to Lauren Michalakis, who did a ton of great work here. Uh, Kathy McGuire, who is working with us and uh, David Jorgensen, who's Director of Data Analytics for Main Care. Okay, so first, um, we are going to talk a little bit about demographics. So this is looking at nursing facilities. I'm not surprising to see that it is a majority uh, female population. Um, here we see uh, about 54% of residents are over age 80. Um, and about 70% of residents uh, rely on, on main care or are enrolled in rank main care. So you can see the importance of main care, not a surprise to any of us in the long-term care system. And we spend uh, main care in state and federal dollars um, over 320 million annually for, to care for over 7,000 members here. So this is a slide for residential care facility residents. Uh, interestingly enough, I was a little bit surprised by this. I'd be curious to see if others are or are not surprised. Um, the population tends to, uh, to skew a little bit older than what we're seeing for our nursing facility residents. So instead of the 54% the combined for ages 80 to 89 and 90 plus for NIFs, here we're seeing actually 58% of uh, RCF residents are over age 80, which I did not expect to see, but you all know much more about these populations than I do. Um, otherwise, similar breakdown between female and male and uh, percentage of main care residents versus residents who, um, whose care is funded by other payers. And feel free to uh, put questions into the chat, I might need some help to monitor that. I have a lot going on on my screens. I'll monitor the chat for you, Michelle. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Paul. All right, um, so this is a slide. We do not have one of these slides for residential care facilities yet. Um, 
we uh, would very much like to do this same analysis for residential care facilities. The point of this slide is to look, um, to take a step away from quality for a moment at variation in what we pay as well as what facility costs are. And this is specifically for nursing facilities. And so each of these uh, little couplets of red and blue lines re uh, represent one facility um, in the state of Maine. And the blue lines show total costs. This is not costs that are just affiliated with main care members. It is costs for all residents in each facility. And then you can see that the red line um, is how much uh, post cost settlement main care reimburses for each facility. Uh, so uh, many of you may know that per federal requirements, we can only pay for the portion of costs that, that uh, is affiliated with Medicaid residents. And so you would expect the red line to be lower than the blue line uh, in all instances uh, where main care at least is not 100%, um, uh, of, doesn't comprise 100% of residents. Um, so we expect the red lines to be lower than uh, the blue lines. Um, one story here is that there's a, a sizable variation in both the cost of care, and this is on a per reimbursement day basis, uh, so it controls for size of the facility. So there's a lot of variation both in the cost of care as well um, as what uh, portion or percentage of those costs main care is, is covering. Um, uh, you can see that on the low end, we've got a cost of 210 uh, per resident per day, and on the high end, it's up to 520. So that's a lot of variation. And uh, we do know that when, um, all right, I won't go into uh, reimbursement methodologies. <laughs> so, so I'll just point that out. I will also point out that um, we have some high outliers. So we have some facilities that are definitely higher cost than others. And like I said, we wanna do the same analysis for res care facilities, but do not have that yet. All right, so turning more specifically to quality, uh, because we don't have lots of time, I'm not gonna spend uh, much time on CMS Care Compare, but again, for nursing facilities, uh, this is what we use for the quality data. It is not specific to main care. Um, it is robust. Uh, these, these ratings, as you may know, are designed to show variation in the state. And so CMS um, makes sure that each state has a representation of one through five star facilities. Uh, so we wouldn't expect to have like all five star facilities or all three star because it's the intention is is to put, is to show that variation so that um, uh, consumers, residents, families can use this data to to help them um, be informed about uh, care options and, and care that they are receiving. Um, and uh, the, the data itself comes from the state in terms of health inspections. It comes directly from facilities uh, in terms of their entries on MDS resident assessments and uh, staffing data. And there's also data that comes from claims. So uh, at a high level, um, recognizing that with this five-star system, it, it, it again, it's distributed to really show that three means you're average, five means you're very high performing, one means you're pretty low performing, right? Um, and so uh, in Maine, our nursing facilities show above average ratings on staffing and quality, slightly below average ratings on inspections. And you can see, again, it's intended to have a distribution, but you can see that We've got on one end 16 facilities that get one star ratings and on the other end we have 22 facilities that get five star ratings and as we look at the slides for the nursing facilities we're really focusing on uh, what does the quality look like at the one star and at the five star and then we also look at an average measure. Um, again for residential care facilities we're looking at the MDS uh, there's 36 different measures. Um, we uh, actually have a, a draft um, overall rating that you'll see at the end of the presentation, but that is very much draft. It is a, a pretty rudimentary and, and we're thinking about um, how to look at that um, going forward. Uh, I will just say that our MDS system is, is, uh, is outdated. It's been around for a long time. Some of the measures are outdated from a clinical perspective. 
We uh, are actively engaged in a current effort uh, with the University of Southern Maine um, to update uh, that, um, the, update the MDS, which is a very labor intensive effort. Um, and so it's going to take us a while, but, uh, but the good news is, is that we are working on it. All right, so these slides are looking at um, different areas of quality measurement, I will say, and I'm just gonna give the caveat again that a lot of the times it's not apples and apples. So this is meant to generate conversation. It is not meant to um, not meant to be decisive statements about what is uh, how nursing facility and residential care facility compare. Uh, and there's just there's there's a lot more research that needs to be done. Michelle, I think you said this early on, but we've got a question just to clarify: the RCF data is main care only. Uh, I believe so, but I'm actually gonna if I don't know if Kathy is on or Sue Panette may know the answer to that or Lauren. So I'm going to defer to someone else for that. Hi, this is Kathy and um, and we collect the uh, residential care assessments on all residents in the facility. So it's for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, so so do you non I'm but, sorry, do you non main care pandemic. facilities report? No, these would be all main care facilities that are reporting. Yeah. I see. So the facility has takes main care, but then all of the residents are represented in the data. Correct. Yep. That's similar on the nursing home side. Although on nursing home, if if you take Medicare, then your your assessments are included as well. So all those licensed facilities. Yep. Great question. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the National Academies report shows um, specific for nursing facilities. Um, uh, that's been the focus of their analysis that uh, higher staffing is associated with higher quality. And so it can be used as a proxy for quality to see the staff time um, that is being dedicated to residents. And uh, Maine, um, uh, this is not true for all states. Uh, there's national conversation going on with us right now, but Maine, as you all know, has required staffing levels. And we can see the results of that in this data. Um, uh, so you can see. Um, that uh actually can we see this here no but what, what you can see here oh there it is sorry <laughs> i haven't looked at this slide in a little bit so you can see that our main one star and five star facilities those are the first two columns on the left so it shows the quote lower performers and higher performers then you can see the um the third uh, column there is the average across main facilities and then the last column on the right is the national average. And you can see that our total minutes um, at overall nurse as well as RN specific uh, per resident day are higher across the one star facilities up to the five star facilities as compared to the national average. So you can see that we are uh, doing relatively well compared to national averages in terms of uh, staff time. Uh, we uh this is another area then you'll start seeing more data but we are still working on staffing analysis for the residential care facilities it, re it requires uh, uh inputting cost report data and doing that analysis and so that is something that uh, we are working on but don't have to show at this point okay so uh it's it's uh, there are areas where Maine shines in terms of quality and areas uh, where we're not doing as well. And it's interesting when we look at these claims-based um, measures for hospitalizations in ED departments, because you kind of see both sides. On, on one hand, uh, Maine is uh, doing very well uh, on hospitalizations. We have lower hospitalization rates um, for the uh, one-star as well as the five-star facilities. Um, but on emergency department visits, uh, we have higher ED visits than you see um, nationally. And there is a fair amount of variation uh, between uh, Maine's one-star and five-star nursing facilities on both of these measures. So certainly room for improvement. Okay, here's some res care facility data. Um, this is not the same measure. So let's, again, we need to be careful about comparisons here. Uh, the previous measure was looking at um, how many hospitalizations there are per 1,000 resident days. 
at this measure coming from MGS data is looking at the percentage of residents who have visited the emergency department without an overnight stay. Um, I don't know that this is really a standard measure anymore. So as we're updating the MGS, we, uh, we may look at this differently. We are also going to be working on some claims analysis so we can do an apples to apples comparison between the NIFs and the RCFs here. Um, so the, the main thing to uh, think about with these two slides is that it looks like there may be greater variation in emergency department rates within the res care facilities um, than we're seeing within the nursing facilities. Uh, this slide here, we've just basically distributed the RCFs into four quartiles based on their performance on this measure. So you would expect to see this trend because that's how we split out the data. But the point of the slide is really to show you that on the high end, um, in the lower performing facilities on this measure, uh, almost 40% of residents have ED visits without an overnight stay. And then on the on the high performing end, uh, it's it's just under eight. So that's a lot of variation between those lower performing and higher performing facilities on this measure. And it seems to be, um, you know, we're talking about a differential of five times as high. That's a bigger rate of variation than we're seeing on the nursing facility side where, um, you know, the rate kind of less than doubles between the one star and the five star facilities. Uh, so this slide was specific to emergency department. This is looking at hospitalization. Again, it's not the same hospitalization measure. We're going to work on apples to apples measures here. This is the percentage of residents um, admitted to the hospital in the last six months. Uh, I'm realizing I am, we are running out of time. So again, you can see um, that there appears to be higher variation across facilities in terms of hospitalization rates for the res care facilities than we see for the nursing facilities. Uh, pressure ulcers for NIF, uh, we perform favorably compared to the national average. Um, there is an extremely low prevalence of pressure ulcers in the res care facilities, uh, only 24 that we see across over 3,700 residents. So we really, um, it's, it's so low that uh, it doesn't make sense to try to do an analysis of any variation. And this may make sense because uh, this is a more mobile population and likely less frail. Um, falls, uh, we do see more falls uh, in Maine than nationally. Um, and this is percentage of residents experiencing falls with an injury. For res care, it's just the prevalence of falls overall. So we would expect to see a higher prevalence, um, but this is a much higher prevalence than what we're seeing for the nursing facilities. Um, and again, this may be related to differences in the population. Uh, also, um, I presented some of these slides to the HHS committee with the legislature. There was um, understandably considerable concern around um, a percentage of residents inappropriately receiving antipsychotic medications. This is an area where we are not doing well compared to the rest of the country, and there is substantial variation between facilities on the NIF side. Um, and I, there's a trend in what we're seeing here where there appears to be more variation uh, within RCF facilities on this front than, than we're seeing uh, in NIFs. And that it also, again, looks at least preliminarily like that the use of antipsychotics might be higher in RCFs than in NIFs. All right, so that's just a sample of some of the quality analysis we've been looking at so far. Um, what is the relationship between cost and quality? Uh, so this, I don't know if I have time to talk about these slides in detail. So what I'll just say is that, again, we know that um, uh, for nursing facilities, that higher staffing is definitively associated with higher quality. And we know that staffing drives a lot of cost. And so we do see a relationship for nursing facilities between cost and quality. Having said that, we also see that, um, that it's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, if you see these low numbers on this slide, the 62, 59, and 70, that is a cost um, per bed day. And those are all the lowest cost facilities in the state. 
and they are rated as three star, four star, and five star, so high performing facilities, even though they are very low cost. Uh, we are working on similar analysis for res care facilities, if possible. Uh, this shows um, our attempt at coming up with a summary score for the res care facilities and then looking at a comparison of rates um, across those. And if there were a trend, you would kind of see for the five star, we'd be seeing higher rates than for the one star. Um, we're not, it doesn't seem like there's a trend here but, or a relationship between cost and quality, but again, this is preliminary analysis. All right, I'm really sorry that we don't have time to talk about <laughs> questions and answers because I would love uh, to hear your feedback and questions and insight and things that we should look into. Um, so we will definitely uh, be doing more of that as we go forward. Thank you so much, Michelle. And uh, we can pick up this conversation again at the next meeting. I'm just struck by how much, uh, you know, good, content there is to uh, dissect with all of you and and clearly at future meetings we want to have more discussion time um, and so be thinking about whether you'd be willing to meet more frequently or for longer periods of time we're trying not to burden you too much um, uh, but think about that we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll communicate with you all in the next week or two uh, maybe with some follow-up questions and so on um karen do you want to close us out please sure sure yeah first of all just thank you thank you everyone uh, the presentations are excellent and your participation is so needed and so necessary um i would offer to um um in terms of uh adding to what paul just said we put sarah's uh, email address in the chat so please feel free after the meeting if you have uh, questions or comments we're more than happy to take those. Um, and that will also inform our next meeting um, or something in between, as Paul indicated. Um, and so our next steps uh, will be for our June meeting. We're really going to dive into those quality metrics. I think um, Karen Lee and Jake and others have talked about the fact that there are lots of quality metrics out there. I think that um, and we have some ideas on what those current quality metrics are. So we'll be diving into that um, as well as following up um, with uh, the information that Michelle provided. So again, we thank you all. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, June 26th from 10 to 1130. And again, we look forward to our continued conversations. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much.